I want to start off um, maybe discussing how you arrived at becoming a drummer, just to set that up. I understand that music was a big part of your home life and that the piano was there. Can you talk a little bit about that musical environment and how you developed early as a musician? My family is, my grandmother was a, a pianist and uh, she had seven daughters. My mother was one of her daughters and uh, she made all of her daughters play the piano because she's a pianist. So in turn, all of my aunts made their children. I have, I have cousins that I have one in New York that teaches, made his debut in the Carnegie is uh, teaching piano in New York now, all, often. And um, his, um, his sisters, brothers, they all know how to play the piano, classics. My immediate family, I was the only one in my family that had leaned towards music. My brothers and sisters rebelled, and my mother didn't press them like my aunts pressed their children, but she used to press me. And I didn't really want to play the piano because I'd heard so much of it with my aunt, because I stayed with my aunt and my cousins a long time, and I learned a lot about the piano. But my mind has always been towards the drums. I don't know what it is. It's just I've never had a drum that, mm -hmm. that I loved. You know, I used to get suspended when I was in school for, for a day. When I, for using pencils on the desk and you know, not teachers Played to call me in the back of the room, Jones. But I was just something about drums that fascinated me. And um, my mother, my mother saw it at an early age, so she didn't really force me into the piano because she wanted me to do what I felt I wanted to do. So uh, I just uh, stayed with the drums as much as I could during my young years as I grew up, and then used to go into nightclubs and hang around the back window and listen to fine drummers in Philadelphia. And, and I finally asked one of them to help me. And Coach Phil Harris, a young drummer in Philly, was the greatest drummer in Philadelphia at the time. And he took me under his wing and showed me a lot of things. And, and I started developing. So you, you didn't take drum lessons, per se? No, yeah, I studied later. later. I had been playing five years professionally before I started to study drums. So, so how did you, when you were, you know, we, we kind of leaped a lot of time, but uh, as a young man, when you were going around the clubs, you were, what, 14, 15, 17, 18? What, what would that Oh, no, I was, I was um, between 13 and 13 and 15 because uh, I went to the army when I was 16. Did you have a set of drums at that point? No. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but so it was just an ear thing? Well, I'd, be, I'd play on anything. Uh -huh. I didn't have any drums at that time, no. So did you start playing uh, music before the Army, after the Army? When did you start working? I came into music after I was uh, discharged. After I was discharged, but see, in the Army, I used to get a chance to go over to the um, rec hall and play with the, uh, in some of the rehearsals, sitting with the, uh, with the, with the uh, company band mm -hmm. when they were playing. They were jamming in those days, and I was just coming along but I used to go in and sit down and play some with them as the best I could play. But that, that wasn't my job. I couldn't be in the band. I was a military policeman. So I used to go over there when I had a chance to get away. So you went to the Army at 16? Yeah, 17. Why'd you do that? Well, I, mean, I put my age up. He's supposed to be 17 before you get in. Why'd you do that? Well, when I came out of school, I just um, didn't see anything I wanted to do. I thought maybe my father, see, my stepfather was a, was a career Army man, and he was a veterinarian veterinarian in the army and he had taught me all kind of everything and the rifle manual and everything you know how to march everything so he wanted me to hurry up and get a radio he, I don't know he maybe want, maybe he wanted to get rid of us because we had three sons and, uh -huh. and my stepfather so we all went I joined the army and my brothers joined uh -huh. and we went away but I still had music in my mind and, but uh, I couldn't uh, go in for the band because I wasn't that qualified uh -huh. but, but so before you went into the Army and made a decision, uh, there were drummers that were teaching you things. Uh, uh, drummers I was listening to. Uh -huh. I was listening to and uh, showing me a few pointers at that age. Uh -huh. A few pointers. I didn't really get with the, with the, and really get into it deep with them until I came home. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Because when I came home, I was, uh, I was just 21. And it took me a little while to get to them and get some 
better lessons from them, and I'm an older person. And I got it, a little, got it together pretty good and went to work in Philadelphia. Who was some, when, when you came out of the Army, who were some of the, the drummers that you began to interact with and get some information? Well, after I was out of service, I was listening to Art and Mass all the time. Uh -huh. I used to come to Brooklyn, I used to come to Brooklyn. <clears throat> See, I was driving a streetcar in Philadelphia mm -hmm. when I got out of service because I was married and I had to have a job. So I was driving a streetcar and I used to go um, Kenny Dennis. Nancy Wilson's ex-husband, who's a drummer also, he and I used to leave Philadelphia on the weekend and go over to Monroe Street in Brooklyn to Mass Roach's house and spend the weekend. Spend two days there. We go over there Saturday and be there Sunday and then leave Sunday and come back. I just come back to work. And we'd hang out with Mass Roach and we would sit up in his room and, and he would uh, take us through different books and we would uh, just talk ideas about drums and he was so helpful to me. Max was very helpful to me in those days. See, Max was out there playing. He was one of my idols at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, he and I were good friends, and he's come to Philly often. And so I got him to say, man, I'm gonna come over to your house on the weekends. So we did that for quite a few weekends. And I learned an awful lot. Max used to tell me some good books to get into. Uh, and what, then I finally found him. Uh, what period of time was this? What, in the 40s? Mm-hmm. Mid-40s? Sure, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Was it was this when Max had that house was sort of like a studio type no, thing? No, he was home with his mother. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. home with his mother and run rushes before his children. Uh, uh -huh. Max and I go back way back to the babies. <laughs> All of his children when they were babies. Uh-huh. So he was home with mom in Monroe Street in Brooklyn. And we I I would not a hundred times, not like that, maybe about five, six times we went over there to help us, you know, help me and Kenny. Kenny was a good friend of his also, so. Uh -huh. And then Kenny Clark was in New York, you know. I had a lot of beautiful people to meet. Uh-huh. But Kenny Clark a big influence uh, in your thinking about well, he was an influence on Max. Mm -hmm. And art. Mm -hmm. So you, th you think of, of, of there's a hierarchy that, that Kenny Clark is at the apex of it? Well, I think Kenny was, uh, Kenny was the the orchestrator of the way we play the drums today. And Kenny was the first drummer that started breaking rhythms and playing the way that we play when we play with a group. Uh -huh. All the drummers used to play different. Then they never had that many drums. Uh -huh. Or the drums you see, some of these guys have 15 drums. Mm -hmm. But um, the, see, uh, Kenny came along with um, Baby Dodds and Sid Catlett. Kenny was back then was playing with um, Fats Waller and all those in those days. Mm -hmm. So um, they were only using like an Indian tom tom and one cymbal and bass drum and snare drum. They didn't have all that other stuff around. Those were great drummers. And I, I came through just that I'm glad that God let me pass this way that, at, at that time. time. And I ran into Baby Dodds and Sid Catlett from, and, and those were the Denzel. Those were the greatest breast players I've ever seen in my life. What, what, what were, what were, I mean, and drummers. What was just. For anecdotes, say what was Baby Dodds and what was he like? No, uh, well, he was just a. What can I say? He was just a natural drummer and a natural person. He was a very beautiful person, happy-go-lucky. I never had. I never heard him say anything funny. Man, I used to go and ask him all kind of questions, as he worked across the street when I was working in uh, 52nd Street in New York. After I went to New York to live, mm -hmm. I couldn't stay out of there. I go there every minute I get a chance. I get a break, I'd be across the street with him. Because he would be using a uh, bass drum, snare drum, and one cymbal, Indian tom tom, and swinging. You know, he was phenomenal. What about Sid Catlett? Well, he was more phenomenal. See, he was like an extension, although a baby may been, it might have been older than Sid, I don't know, there were ages. But they were rare at the same time. But Sid was more of a, Sid had a little more fire. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was a very technical place. You know, he was a master of playing the snare drums and the cymbals. Sid was the master of playing the brushes and, you know, because Dizzy had Sid for a while doing, making some records with him. Sid was uh, fast and hands were beautiful. He was, uh, he was uh, a little different. Uh-huh. And then, He's a little more polished, I'll say. Then, then a little baby more went. polished. And then, and then Kenny comes out of them. Well, Kenny was around during that same time. 
-hmm. But Kenny had a different direction in mind. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. his direction was, uh, was fantastic. You, 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 Sid and Baby used to love to watch him. Did you uh, get a chance? Did you spend a lot of time with Kenny Clark? Oh, yeah, we used to live with Kenny. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh huh. In New York? Or? Mm -hmm. And during that time, it, would it, did you share a lot with him? Every day we could. Every day we could. We'd play on the practice pads. Mm -hmm. Practice pad and snare drum. Kenny said, man, this is just called the one-eyed monster. <laughs> <laughs> uh, practice pads. Cause he, he didn't like practice pads too much. That's why I never used them. Uh -huh. I didn't get too much help from him. Uh -huh. He used the drum. You spent a lot of time with the snare drum. Snare drum on a bar stool. I have a bar stool on my house that I use. Uh -huh. With a vinyl top on it. Uh -huh. I use that. Rather than, rather than a practice Yeah, practice. because when you use a stick, the stick just drops dead. It don't bounce. Uh -huh. If it bounces, you made it bounce. Okay. If you drop it on a rubber pad, it'll say... It bounces bounce by itself. itself. So you get more... You get more s Whatever the stick does, you have to make do, it do. do. Right, right. If you want to say... D -d 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 -d, you have to make it do that. If you drop it on a bar stool, then you'll say... Right. If you drop it on a pad, it'll do that. Because right. the rubber makes it bounce. Right. But so I never approved of using... Um, practice pads in my day during my when I practice. I practice on the surface like this. Just like this. And we get no help from here. The stick doesn't drop dead immediately. So if you can roll on this, you, you can really roll. You can roll. Yeah. Well you know, not, not necessarily I'm still still after that. That's a hard thing to master the roll. Uh -huh. The best people I know that master rolls are march drummers. Mm -hmm. Did you have marching experience? Oh, yeah. Drum and bugle for sure. Well, I had been. A lot of the books are in cut time, march time, you know. Mm -hmm. Books I studied. Mm -hmm. And I studied with it. My formal teacher was uh, a master percussionist and Cozy Coles, one of the greatest teachers in life for me. Is that who you taught? That's who well, you studied with? Yeah, I studied with Cozy about three and a half years. Uh huh. When, when was that period in your During the 40s when I moved to New York. Uh huh. Were you about 22, 23 at that point? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what kind of what kind of exercise would you what, what would cause what would be a typical what would be a cold cold lesson for you what would you go through his books go through his books huh? <laughs> go through his books and they tell you about your hands and how to use them how to develop them as best you can so you can get some speed and power uh -huh. and uh, so it's like exercises a lot of exercises well his exercises the ex there are exercises and there are exercises. Uh -huh. See, some of the drum books, the average drum book I look at, because I teach often when I'm home, mm -hmm. and I've had a school in England, I've taught a lot of drummers, and a lot of, Michael Carver's one of my ex-students, and a whole lot of drummers. And Andrew Cerullo was one of my formal students. Not, he wasn't there a long time, but he was there. But I have uh, go down the line with an awful lot of drummers that are playing professionally today and have developed. But, it's a, it's you have to get to get a good knowledge of the instrument and your reading ability, mm -hmm. your rudimental ability. That's what I went to Koji for for rudiments because I was playing them but I didn't know what they were. Right. So if you asked me about a C or D or E with a piano, I knew that from being at home all the time when I was a kid. But but if you put it on, the, if you write it out for drums, I didn't know what it would look like. Mm -hmm. So it calls you something what it looks like and what you're playing, and that's what it is. Right. So then they make me develop them, the rudiments. And once you get the rudiments in your hands, then you can do what you want to do. You know, in other words, you have your bag of tricks. That's what I call it. Yeah. Well, it, we've talked about brushes. We've talked about rolls. We've talked about things that, that cozy coal, uh, you know, the kind of training that you had from him. Were there, would you uh, be interested in showing us some of these things and uh, maybe yeah, well, elaborating I'm gonna, some things. Um, I'm going to do a little, they have a brush book out. Mm -hmm. It's called Brush Artistry. Uh-huh. It's in the stores. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to um, just do a few things out of the book, a few motions that are in that book. And then I, will, and then I want to um, just play around the set rudimentally or whatever comes into my mind just to just to just to just to play the drums for a while and then um, I want to do a thing I call symbolectomy okay it's like the dance on the symbols it's nothing but 
all symbols. Okay. And what you can do with symbols. Just some ideas. And, okay. And it's, it's like something, and all this is coming off the top of my head now. I don't have anything planned because I never plan. So if you plan, then sometimes plans go awry. Something is, and I like to just look at the drums and go play them. Oh, go play them, man. Yes, go play them. Okay. Don't, see, I, I, I often hear people say, I was telling a kid yesterday at this concert, his father brought him to meet me, a little youngster. And he was talking, he loves drums, that's what he wants to do. So he was saying about, he asked me about my snare drum, he saying, but if I beat it this way, I said, wait a minute, now look, you want to get this in your head first, and you never beat the drums. Don't ever let anybody, if anybody says you beat the drums, you tell them I play the drums. Don't say, you don't beat the drums, play them. Mm -hmm. Drum beaters don't ever sound good, so be it, you play it. Mm -hmm. An instrument is to be played, not beat. There's nothing nice to be beat. I mean, it's a little kid laughing. Yeah. Well, that's true. That's, a, that's a, right. A distinction that really is a difference. Okay. Can we cut and go do that? Okay.
The last segment of the drum solo you just played, after the cymbal portion, seemed to flow out of a, a creative use to rudiments. Is this, the, you know, part of what you got out of the Cozy Cole experience? That real, the real strong foundation rudiments that allows you to, to branch off like that. Yeah, out of Cozy's uh, ideas of how you should uh, be a rudimental drummer and help you in developing your hands will help you in developing your mind too. As long as you know all the rudiments, like I said earlier, it's like a bag of tricks that you can reach into when you need them. Mm -hmm. If there's something I want to say, I can use a rudiment to say it. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot easier than just, if you, and most drummers that don't know anything about rudiments have a hard time saying what they want to say. So this is conversation. Okay. You know, most of the great drummers I know are rudimental drummers, you know. All the great ones I know went through rudiments, and don't mean that you have to sound like a Boy Scout when you're playing, but it's nice to have the knowledge of them, and you can make them sound, I make them do anything I want to do, and I just felt like working out because my hands felt that way. That way. You say it's early in the day for you. Yeah, it is early for me. Uh -huh. It's early in the day for me to be playing by myself. Okay. So usually in the early in the day when I'm usually, have to, I have to play early sometimes, some afternoons. In fact, we played the Clifford and I played the gig in, in Zurich at 11 o'clock in the morning when the, the, the gig started. Mm -hmm. But um, when, you, when you're playing with other, other fellas, it comes, you come around sooner because of the other instruments. But when you're playing by yourself, really, this, is, this reminds me of um, what I used to do when I, was, when I was first started to play drums. I used to get up in the morning and practice like that for about an hour. Yeah. And then leave it go and come back later and do some more. But I, I don't do this at all, man. <laughs> this time of the day. Yeah. When you were when you first developing as a drummer, that real intense period. How much time were you putting in on the instrument? Oh, I wouldn't. I, I've heard guys say they play six, seven hours a day. I, I've never done it in my life. Mm -hmm. I practice like um, an hour at a time, an hour, and I go away and leave the drums alone for half an hour and come back and do another hour. That's what I'm doing for the day. Uh -huh. That's all. Then I come back sometimes and some days I would just practice one thing that, I, that I'm trying to get together, something that I can't do. Uh -huh. I'd practice that for maybe 45 minutes and leave it alone. Uh -huh. and go do something else, get it out of the ear, and then come back again, do another 45 minutes. That's my practice for the day. And my practice would be not just all around the drums like that I was just doing, I would get on one thing and develop that and clean it up and then get something else. Mm -hmm. As soon as I clean that up, get another one, clean it up, and then you get them all together, they're all cleaned up, you can put them together. But if you sit up there playing all kinds of different things and trying to develop that way, it's hard to keep your mind on everything that you want to do. You've got to concentrate on one thing that you're not doing correctly, get that done. Mm -hmm. Use something else that day, you can pick two things a day, but not you know, not six hours of, I don't know what you could play in six hours. <laughs> I don't know what the drummer can be sitting down and he practice for six hours. Or four hours, I can't understand that. Me, not even two straight. Yeah. Sit down and practice for two hours, it don't make sense to me. I rather spend the time reading and trying to read some books or something, drum books or something for an hour or something. Get into that and then leave it alone. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, that's all related in a way. It's all part of development. Uh, some teachers will teach you different ways, you know. But all the young drummers that are trying to play the drums, they get involved in it and they feel like they want to play that long. They think because they're soaking wet that they've done something. You know? mm -hmm. Not necessarily. They don't find out they didn't do anything. Well, switch gears a little bit. Um, a little bit earlier we were talking about uh, your early, the middle 40s period. Can you give me uh, d Talk about the scene in Philadelphia at that point. Who were some of the prominent musicians that you were working with or that were your well, peers? I, it's, easy to, it's easy to talk about them. The only thing that um, escapes me is the um, actual dates and whatnot because uh, that's a growing up period for me right in there. And, and just having been released from the Army and whatnot and wanting to do something else and and getting married and whatnot, and, and being that young and working hard every day, I wanted to go in another direction because I didn't like hard work. Yeah. It's the hardest work I like to do, and I wanted to get away from that, but I had to still work to support my family. But um, 
I used to go to the clubs and just listen and sit in. And I wasn't, uh, I was still growing. Mm -hmm. I remember when Jimmy Heath had a big band in the city. Had a very fine drummer, Specs Wright, and Willie Armstrong, and Nasir Dean after he changed his name. They were great drummers, but uh, Coastville Harris, like I said, taught me most of my, you know, most of uh, my formal training as a youngster. And an old man that used to be in the nightclub across the street from where I lived, I used to watch him through the window. And then on the days of his rehearsals in the afternoon, I could go in there because it was in the back room. And I, he'd show me a lot of things. And I learned from different drummers. And I was, I was, yeah, I would ask. Mm -hmm. Didn't, I'm, just, I'm never too humble to ask a drummer. I do that today. If I see a young drummer doing something, then I wonder what it is. I just ask him and then write it down, and I got it, mm -hmm. and I know what it is. Mm -hmm. Use it, turn it around my way, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I was, and met a lot of the musicians and coming up in Philadelphia, Jimmy Oliver and Hassan. And about you know, to stop for a minute and talk about Hassan. He's a figure. I only know of one record that he did, uh, The Pianist. Mm -hmm. um, well, during what period was he active? And he how? was active when we were when I was in school. Mm -hmm. We used to call him Count. Lineford, because he'd been like Count Basie in those days. Uh -huh. His name was William Lineford, uh -huh. and he became uh, Hassan Ibn Ali. Uh -huh. But um, he, um, after he accepted Islam, he played. He was playing um, more fluently. But in school, he was just playing Count Basie's thing. Very, then, he very went into the, then he went into um, a different, another. He went through another door of piano. Uh -huh. And he was playing beautiful piano in those days that, that later on the concept of music went into that. Mm -hmm. But Hassan was doing that years ago. You mean before. a more dissonant, angular approach? Yes, yeah, playing, you know, in the almost avant-garde, uh -huh. but correct. See, and Elmo, Elmo Hope was his, was his biggest influence. Uh -huh. But Elmo was um, Bud's influence. And Monk, Elmo and Monk and Bud loved Elmo so much, man. Elmo, Elmo was the real genius of the piano. He was a genius. Mm -hmm. And Monk loved him and Bud, because we used to see Bud come and grew up in Philly, too. Mm -hmm. And um, Even though he was from New York, he spent a lot of time in Philadelphia? Bud's from Philadelphia. Bud's from Philadelphia. Bud Powell's from Philadelphia. He came from Willow Grove. Uh -huh. That's originally uh -huh. Bud and Richard. But Elmo, uh, Elmo's West Indian, he came from New York. Uh -huh. But we, after I finally moved to New York, because I, uh, when I left Philadelphia, I left Philadelphia with them. With Elmo? With Elmo Hope and Joe Morris and Johnny Griffin and the Rhythm and Blues band. That was Bull Moose Jackson's band? No, no. It was This was um, um, Johnny Griffin and um, Joe, Joe Morris. Joe Morris uh -huh. Johnny Griffin and Joe Morris and Matthew G and Percy Heath. And, and, I played drums. Elmo Hope was the um, was the uh, pianist. Mm -hmm. This is an eight iron. piece rhythm and blues band. We had about five or six hits on the June Boss mm -hmm. at once. Oh yeah, what were some of the What were these hits? You remember what they were? Oh yeah, we played um, Wow. We played the Spider. I'm on all those records. Atlantic. Mm -hmm. My just album goes all the way back there. Mm -hmm. And we made a lot of things when he had Wow and. Then, and Joe used to sing it. He used to sing um, a few tunes that were on, on record. That's what the real days of, see, they had just uh, left Lionel Hampton's band. They were in Lionel Hampton's band. Mm -hmm. And I used to go out when the, never Lionel Hampton would come in town, and Hampton used to always say to me, come on, I'm going to play something, man. Come on, play something. And he'd play Flying Home and all that stuff. And I was getting stronger, and I could play with it. And I always had a night to play with a, with a, with a group, and. And uh, with a big band, even though I wasn't um, wasn't reading big band music, mm -hmm. but I had a way of uh, just being able to play with them. Mm -hmm. so it just was whatever way I felt, as long as you could swing, everything was cool. Mm -hmm. But Joe and Johnny decided to leave Ham's band and form their own band. So they, they they did so, and they had a drummer from Chicago who got sick and he couldn't leave the city, and they came to Philadelphia, and that's when I joined their band. And um, at the Zanzibar Bar in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. I sat in with him one night. Mm -hmm. So they gave me the job, and that, and that was Barnstorm, and I went on the road with them, and that was uh, the beginning of my road career with them. Mm -hmm. That's from Miami to Maine, and from 
from New York to California to New York to Los Angeles. Everywhere. San Francisco, on the road. Yeah. Driving. I was doing the driving and playing the drums. So you say that, that Elmo was, was an influence on Monk and Bud, not vice versa. Mm hmm. They were, they were influenced, they influenced each other. Yeah. But Elmo had the heaviest. You know, see, they, they really loved each other. I used to go to the house and watch all three of them play the piano one by one. He would start a tune and play as much of it as he wanted to do, and then the next one would come right in wherever he'd leave off, and Bud would play right where he was in Bud's house on St. Nicholas. And I used to sit there for hours during the day and watch them do that because we were all friends. And man, it was some, I wish to God I had had a tape recorder in those days, but it was in the fabulous, I never knew. Who. It's a shame they when they were using wire recorders in those days, you know, mm -hmm. you know, no tapes. But if you had a cassette in those days, man, I would be, oh my God, it'd be worth millions. Another musician that uh, in Philadelphia that uh, is, whose name comes up in reference, but it's kind of obscure, is Cal Massey. Well, yeah, but Cal was around in those days too. Uh huh. Sure, Cal was a very excellent musician. He used to play trumpet with us all the time when we were see when we were growing up and I was going around the city sitting in, we used to have sessions at everybody's house. Mm -hmm. Next week you'd be at my house. This week everybody had a piano in the house. Johnny Coles would be at your house next week and it'd be uh, two o'clock, the door would start opening, and here comes Coltrane, here comes Jimmy Heath and two or three other drummers. I would be there, and saxophone players and Trumpet players, and we would just so we just have a couple sets. Everybody play something, you know. We put the quintet together and play. Mm -hmm. And that trumpet player got tired, let another trumpet player play. But it was a learning process. Everybody was learning before drummers there. I'd play some with these guys, and then stop and let another drummer play. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we wouldn't even stop the music; it just come right on in. Well, you know that that kind of situation. Uh, that's how the music was. Uh, was was passed down in that time. Mm -hmm. That doesn't exist much anymore. It well, it don't exist today because you've got you've got so many um, egotistical musicians before they even get to know their instrument. Mm -hmm. It's so egotistical, and they got such a big head. And if they learn how to play two or three notes, and then the having God open the door for them, though those who can't play, they can just make a whole lot of noise mm -hmm. and get away with it, and they carry a bag around with them and didn't really study. Mm -hmm. Some of them were on, they were on the bandstands a few years ago, making all that noise because they could get away with it. But it turned around and now they can't get away with it and they have to go and study some more. But um, you see, musicians are very funny, some musicians. That is, well, I don't think they're musicians because if they were, they wouldn't be that funny. They don't want to, they won't, uh, they want to help nobody with what they're doing. Fear they, may, they may go past faster than they do. Mm -hmm. Try to keep all the knowledge to themselves, which is uh, it's a shame that it has to be that way. Mm -hmm. But dude, there's so many other musicians, man, like myself, man. I don't anything I could help a drummer with, I would try, and you know, whatever. And if you ask me, and it's nothing about saying, no, oh, I don't want to talk about it or something. And I think that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But you got a lot of musicians that do that. Don't want to discuss their instrument at all, and don't have any sessions where you can come and play. And when you're playing in a club, if somebody can play a little bit and come, they come to see you and would like to play some, you know, no, no, we don't allow them to sit there. I think that's ridiculous. Give everybody a little shot somewhere, if it's possible. Some clubs, you can't do that. Yeah. But in some clubs, you, you can set aside a session, a jam session time. Was, was during that time, was, was Philadelphia really different than other cities in that, in that oh, kind of? Oh, yeah, yeah. We've been, had so many clubs in Philly, which it is today, man. We got a lot of clubs. Uh -huh. Musicians can play in many, many clubs in Philadelphia. Uh -huh. And in Philadelphia, you don't hear. You know, see, Philadelphia's been that way as long as I've known it, man. And every club I go in in Philadelphia, man, they try to, they're trying to play some modern, progressive black music. Mm -hmm. Some good bebop and some good contemporary music. Music that people can hum, mm -hmm. music that people can dance by, music that people can listen to. Mm -hmm. Constructive music that's pleasing to the ear. And then you have the other loud electronics in some clubs. But the majority of the people in Philadelphia don't cater to that. Mm -hmm. The only the people cater to it are the, the young ignorant children that haven't heard any music at all. And, 
all they want to do is hear something blaring and put earphones on and ruin their, ruin their eardrums and whatnot. Mm -hmm. they, don't, uh, they don't teach it in schools. Did you, uh, an important uh, musical relationship in your life was the one with Tad Dameron. Did you meet him in Philadelphia? How did that, how yeah, did well, you associate I met Tad in Philly the same way. I was in Philadelphia and Art Blakey didn't, didn't get to a job and I, uh, they asked me to make it because I was right there next to him. And um, the, the guys in New York had been hearing about me in Philadelphia, and every time they come in, they knew. Uh, a lot of them used to tell me, said, man, you, gotta, you, know, you should be living in New York, man. I said, yeah, well, when I feel like I'm ready, I'll, I'll move, you know. So I worked with Tad's band there, with Dexter and Freddie Webster and whatnot, and Tad and I became good friends. Mm -hmm. And I didn't see him again until later on in New York. After I finally moved to New York, well, I saw him again, but in, in and out of town. Uh -huh. But then we became great friends. In New York. I mean, when I, I went out with him at Bull Moose Jackson, he was the band director. And uh, all the time, every time he wanted to do records or anything, he just made it sure that I would be the drummer. Did you actually work on lots of, of pieces of music with him? Mm -hmm. and did, did you and he develop pieces, some of his pieces? Oh, we together? did a lot of collaboration on a lot of tunes, because when. When I went to live with him, I'm with him constantly, all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, he called me in the gym and said, how do you like this, Joe? And I said, yeah, man. And then he would get to a spot where he'd say, I wonder what I should put in there. You got any suggestions? It would be a thing like that. Mm -hmm. Would you mind, at this point, uh, mm -hmm. I don't think people know that, a lot of people don't know that you that you do play some piano. A little bit. A little very bit. Little. A little bit or very little, okay. Very little because I, it's, it's just something that I love and uh, I've been studying and uh, now more so than ever trying to develop. Uh, see, I like to use it for writing. See, I can, Tad used to show me how to mm -hmm. make a chord and what horn to give a note if you want to voice it. I've written a few things for the mm -hmm. band and whatnot. Mm -hmm. <coughs> But that instrument you have to play fluently to play. I can play some some compositions or compositions and things like that. Mm -hmm. But to really um, play with the group or the band and and do all the heavy solo where you have to work with it like you work with any other instrument. I don't have the time to do that. Mm -hmm. The only thing I have the time to do with that instrument is learn how to play some pretty chords as best I can and some melodies or whatever. Mm -hmm. At least the knowledge of the piano you know, I have, but you have to... Would you mind sitting at the piano for us? No, I was, yeah, I'm going to play one. I play a composition I wrote for my wife. I just wrote it. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I call it Wheezy. Her name is Eloise, and I call it Wheezy. Uh -huh. And I'm going to... Um, it's an impromptu thing. It goes into the little tempo. It's in and out of tempo. Mm -hmm. I think it sets better, but when I do it for the band, when I write it out for the band, it'll have to be in a slow tempo. Okay. More, a little, little, little more than the ballad. Okay. Yeah. Want to cut now? What, what kind of time we got? <laughs>
time. How important he is as an arranger. Your feelings about that. Why Dameroni and then I, you know, ask you about Miles kind of thing. And then uh, if we have time, about, you know, we might throw in this thing about the whole Dracula trip. Five seconds. Three, two, one. Well, you, you, play, you said that was a little, little bit more than a ballad. You'd like to slow it down, you know, to ballad, to ballad type tempo. Yeah, put it in a little semi sweet Mm hmm. Three, three movements or something. When it's finally, when I finally decide to do it, I may put it in a. Different moods, three moves. Mm -hmm. Tad, just you know, going back to Tad Dammon for a minute. Uh, what is your feeling about his importance? Uh, you know, we hear the names. You know, Tali Parker, and Dizzy Gillespie. You know, Max Roach, Kenny Clark. In terms of the, you know, the bebop, the hierarchy bebop is a very important setting. That more. What do you think Tad fits in there, especially well, with other Tad composer was, arrangers? He was the forerunner of all the bebop, man. Tad is the the originator of writing all those all those hip tunes that he did for Dizzy's band, mm -hmm. the Squirrel, Hot House, and oh, Tad's got so many. Stay on it, my God! If you can see me now, our delights, his delight, Tad's delight. Tad was writing all of those things that all of the musicians in my time grew up on. We grew up on his music, grew up on his figures. He used to see. In other words, he would write a tune with the chords and the melody. He would pick a tune like Charlie Parker would do. Would pick a tune like um, out of nowhere and write a bebop figure to it. Tad would be writing things like that, and he was saturating the market with it because it just came off the top of his head, and it was, of his head, and it was beautiful, the, the tunes that he composed. And all the musicians, if you didn't know those tunes, man, you would be obviously, you, know, you, can, you, couldn't, you couldn't go nowhere and play with the fellas. They would be playing, they would call a tune and, and play, the, play the bebop figures on them. Which became um, hit records, and a lot, of, a lot of those things were. And Tad was a heavy influence on all the writers. And Quincy, man, he would come up under listening to Tad. All the great writers today, and you can very rarely find a writer on writing you can't play, and and you don't hear him touch on Tad's voicings or the way he used to put a band together. That's why he makes he, Tad can make him. Um, nine pieces sound like twenty, and the way he would the way he would put it on the orchestra. Mm -hmm. You know, he's done a lot of the symphonic things. Tad is Tad was a genius, man. He was a genius. Mm -hmm. He used to love to play with us too. Sometimes he was a good comp. He could comp good. He used to play funny souls. His souls used to be very tricky and funny. But he used to play. All the fellows loved him to be there comping because he'd give you the right lay the carpet down for you. To play on. Oh yeah, Tad was the greatest composer that I've ever heard. And orchestrator, I don't. I hear. I hear a lot of great composers today, and coming up during his time. But they couldn't touch him, as far as I'm concerned. And he could never get the recognition that he's supposed to have gotten uh, for his contribution. He contributed more to this form of music than anybody I know, any composer out there. There's not one out there that contributed that much to this music. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and you're saying that. In respect to Ellington, Monk. Well, Duke's, see, Duke's music wasn't the kind of a, Duke's contribution could never be surpassed. Mm -hmm. But his music was different than Tad's music. See, Duke loved what Tad came up with. See, Tad, Duke came along before Tad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, Tad's an extension from Duke Ellington. Only he changed. Just like when Dizzy was in Cab Calloway's band, Cab Calloway fired him because he was playing too much trumpet. Mm -hmm. He thought he was playing nothing. Cab thought he was playing nothing, but Dizzy was playing in a new constructive way of playing the horn. Mm -hmm. Guys were playing, the trumpet player started, and they used to think that when Louis Armstrong would hit the C above the staff, that was high C. And high C, man, he go above optimal C's. <laughs> Louis used to work up to that, hit that C up there, and everybody think, oh, he's, he's above the staff. He go three, three options above that, man, the trumpet players today. Hit him on the head, G's and E's. Mm -hmm. 
Louis never played no G's and E's in his day. Way up there, for what reason? Cat Anderson, Whistler, and Dukes, man, came later. <coughs> Everything changes. Mm -hmm. The horns started changing. All the old timers didn't like bebop because they couldn't play it. Mm -hmm. Nice, that ain't nothing, that's noise. It's never been noise, man. It's, it's going to the places where you dare, they dare not go. They say, oh no, man, you can't play that flatted fifth. What do you mean you can't play a flatted fifth? Flatted fifth's a pretty chord. Mm -hmm. You know, if you flat it, or you do something with the chord out of the ordinary, one, three, five, or whatever that is, that they do, that they were doing with the chords and, and church chords, and if you, if you dress it up, then you're wrong. But that's not true. Today, all the chords are dressed up beautiful. You do, you, you put it, you, you, you write, you write dissonance and things today, you know? You deliberately put, you deliberately put two notes together, like a C and a D in a chord. You deliberately do that. Whereas, you know, you don't do that. You can't put those two together. But you do, and if you listen to it, according to what you have in the root, and what you put on the top, if you've got those two notes in the middle, they sound beautiful. It's a dissonance, but it's, it's for the ear. Who the, listen to the greatest, the, 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 the great symphonic composers. They had a lot of don'ts that they wouldn't do. If they heard some of the music they hear today, they'd probably commit suicide. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? What they, what, they would, what they would consider wrong. Yeah, yeah. You know, I doubt, you know, I often, I often have said this on, on different interviews. I think if Beethoven and Mozart and Franz Liszt them had heard Art Tatum, I think they might have committed suicide. Mm -hmm. If they'd heard a pianist like Art Tatum, I think they might have uh, either uh, marveled at him or decided to uh, jump off the bridge or something to see somebody playing a piano like that and playing it with so much cleanliness and so much accuracy and so much speed and with so much knowledge of music. Mm -hmm. hey, but you mentioned Art Tatum today to our children, they don't know anything about Art Tatum. Greatest thing ever played it to me and to many, many millions of people. Our Tatum is the phew. Billy Taylor, Oscar Pettif, Oscar Peterson, they'll tell you about Art Tatum. They knew him. I, I, knew, I worked with him. I knew him every night. When did you work with Art Tatum? Unbelievable. Hmm? When did you work with Art Tatum? I worked with Art Tatum and, uh, and Ben Webster, a trio, every night. In New York, when I was working in Birdland in the 50s. Uh huh. Sure, I said, finish Birdland and get in a cab and dash uptown to my after hour gig. <laughs> Nobody but Art and Ben, that's all. It's snare drum, bass drum, and one cymbal. And breasts, no sticks. After hour place, St. Nicholas. Beautiful. Oh. Every night. Can you imagine what that is now? With the genius? Two genius, Ben Webster's a genius. Mm -hmm. I came here in Washington with Ben for two or three years straight when we worked together. Mm -hmm. I worked with Ben. Where'd you work here with him? What place? We worked here to Ben Gazzi. We worked around the corner in, in, in a couple clubs there. We worked at Olivia Davis's club here. Uh -huh. I've been here with Ben many, many times. Miles, too. Uh, I'm glad you did that because it would be. I would probably be assassinated by someone if we, we went through this interview and we didn't talk about your relationship with Miles Davis. Well, my relationship with Miles is such a... I mean, you could go volumes on that, but... That's a, you know, that, that would take me 10 years to sit here and talk about him because it, never, it could never, it never ends. And, well, let's talk about you know, it. Our relationship is still cool, you know. Let's talk about it for about five minutes. Well, you know, I, Miles is, a, you know, I really... Miles is a very strange person, and when I say strange person, as far as uh, uh, it's strange uh, when people talk about him, you know. But me, I know he's on. He, if he reads anything I say, he just laughs and say, "Well, he knows I'm," you know. But people usually say things about him that they don't really know. Mm -hmm. It's hearsay. It's hearsay, and they shouldn't shouldn't say. Uh, you know, you shouldn't say anything like that. You shouldn't well, what I'm interested in, like we were talking before about how the band got together. How oh, with the band, and you know, yeah. I just, well, see, I knew Miles when I met Tad. I knew Miles before Tad mm -hmm. coming in town. And uh, we got together, 
in Philadelphia in the club. We got together in Philadelphia in the club, and uh, he was doing a single, and I was I had the house trio. He came in and worked a couple of weeks, and fell in love with me. I fell in love with him. I said, mm -hmm. we should be playing together. Something I wanted to play with him anyway, man. And he came back again. And, so we finally said, well, man, why don't you come on and go out with me for a while? We go out and play something. I said, all right. I went out with him. He says, we're just a duo, just he and I, on the road. Man. And I'd get in different towns and try to get a piano player, a bass player, and finally get a saxophone player. Well, he did a quartet for a long time. We, we were working here, quartet. Mm -hmm. And he used to talk about a saxophone player and the correct. You were talking about uh, forming the band, forming the band, and, and Ray Ray Bryant. Well, Ray Bryant, Ray Bryant was the first pianist, and um, forget the, uh, the basis. Oh, as well as I know him, too, it's hard to use that. Anyway, I just thought that Ray was um, a little bit too much. Um, he had more church in him than he had Bud Powell in him. Mm -hmm. Ray grew up in the church, mm -hmm. which Ray is a fine pianist, excellent pianist. But his comp feeling and whatnot was more in the gospel thing. And because um, he used to play for church all the time, and his kid we were all growing up, you know, his parents and they had church. So Miles said he wanted something different. So I said, well, man, when she read his Bud Powell around here, he's played his Bud stuff. And so he got ready to come in. And we still had the, uh, the bass player there. And got John Coltrane to come in with us. Mm -hmm. So the first night we started playing, he said, man, this sound now we begin to sound. And Miles loved Train, he loved Red, so he was happy. Mm -hmm. So he said he had a bass player in New York, which was a Paul. I didn't know Paul. I had never met Paul. But Miles had, so he sent for him, and that started the... As soon as we played the first night, Miles went out and bought uniforms for us. <coughs> that was when he knew the personnel he wanted. That was it. No, he didn't know the personnel he wanted. He just knew that he, he knew he wanted Paul, but he knew he didn't want what he was playing with. Yeah. So we were, he was asking them. He knew about Train. Train had been with Dizzy. Had been out there with Eddie Clean and Vincent. He'd been training. Been out with a whole lot of people. Miles had heard him, but he never knew that that the saxophone player that he was looking for would be training. I'm the one that said, "Man, why don't you try him? I think you and him would be. Mm -hmm. You look for that marriage. You look for the marriage between horns. It's a marriage, man. Mm -hmm. But he was lucky. He got a marriage between horns and rhythm section. Mm -hmm. It's a musical telepathy. That's one of the greatest things you can have when five men can play together and. Don't have to rehearse, we never rehearsed. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. You never rehearsed no music, man. I don't say too lazy to rehearse, man. Me too. So man, come on, man, let's play it tonight and play it like that tomorrow. He always used to say that. I said, what? He said, yeah, man, you remember what you played. You remember the tempo, you the drummer. And the next night we just played this uh, we played the, the beginning like we did and the ending like we did, but inside you never know what's gonna happen in there. Every night is different. Uh huh. Uh huh. But that made it so beautiful, man. It made the music so beautiful. Because everything's spontaneous inside, but we know how we're going to leave and we know how we're going to start. And we know how fast we're going to go, how slow we're going to go. So you can get as pretty as you want to get inside and do what you want to do. And whatever you feel like, when it comes to you, you just turn around and look at you go, you got it. Makes nice music, makes you. I learned so much. I learned an awful lot there, man. In that band. Oh, man. Sure. Certainly, man. Everybody that ever had something to say, man, they had something to say. And suggestions. You never have nobody getting drugged with what you play. We had a lot of fun, man. It was mm. fun, fun. It's a happiness. You know, it's a, I wish I could get that again in this life before I leave it. That complete feeling of with uh, everybody on the best. That I almost get it with. Um, in my own group. I get it anyway. Everybody in my group is cool. You mean Dan Maroney? Oh, yeah. Everybody in Dan Maroney is cool. They're beautiful people. So I, I get, I almost get that, I almost get that 
feeling, but it's hard to get the telepathy with, with eight other people. Because you don't, unless you're playing together every night, week after week after week. See, I haven't gotten that much exposure, although we've been together over three years. And just the promoters and whatnot just seem to lean towards other groups and tell me that I, that I can't afford it and all that. But I see they can afford 19 piece bands, 17 piece bands, and take them all out on festivals and whatnot. But when they come to a small nine piece band, it makes me feel as though they, uh, they, 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 they want to try to keep Tad's music hidden. Mm -hmm. See, that, the music that I've been playing with Tad, we've got about 12 or 15 more arrangements that we haven't even played. Yeah. We've done two, nomin two Grammy nominated albums. And I've been saving the meat and the meat and <laughs> all the way down the line. Again, we've got, we can do two more albums, man, of Tad's music. Tad, Tad, there's no end to it, man. He wrote so much. He wrote so much, man. There's so many more, so many more compositions that he, would, he had that he was doing before, he, at the time he died, which I haven't even touched on him yet. His wife has them, and she says, they're from me. She's in, in London. Said you and there, all this is yours. He, you know, he would want you to have it. That's who I have permission to use his name and whatnot, and Dameroni and whatnot. And she and I, of course, we were friends when he was alive. Because we were, we were with him, you know, and several times. And I was with him on two of his heart attacks. And the third, I was in Japan, and I was probably I was so sick. I, mean, I thought maybe, maybe I might have been with him on that third one. And I was with him on two of them. And I knew where he kept his nitroglycerin pills, and I'd get on him, man. I'd get on him, give it to him, give it to him. Mm -hmm. Fell out, man. I knew what was happening, because he knew he'd be tough, man. I lived with him. I see him going like that, I see him knowing he's having a heart attack. Well, I know how to do it. I know what to do for him, with the chest, and breathing the mouth, put the pill in the, everything, man. And get him to the hospital. They had one in Miles' house. One in the house we lived in, one in Miles' house. And then the next one he had, I was in Japan in March of 65 when it happened. But I'm gonna keep him alive as long as I can and keep him keep him alive in the people's ears. Well you put some of it in the in the people's ears this weekend. At uh, when you performed at the Dan Maroney concert at the Capital City Jazz yes. Festival, I'd like to come back again sometime and and really um, have some more of the beautiful things that he's composed and arranged and let the people hear some more because he had some spectacular music. Okay.